yeah the recording is on so we can continue um yeah um brother shay if you're here you can ask your question thank you pastor yes, yes. so uh, it's just a follow up question again thank you so much for the detailed um, explanation that 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 was a great one ma i was just asking another question again that could it also again be I, I mentioned the old testament now i'm going to the new testament could it also be because of the verse in uh, revelations 5, revelations 12 verse 11 that they have overcome the enemy by the words of their testimony and by the blood of the lamb are we are we using that verse out of context or what do you think um, is the real explanation in relation to what you explained about how we apply the blood? Uh, because there have even been there, there are even songs that that say, "Oh, I plead the blood, I plead the blood." Like there are many songs that talk about the blood, um, you know, just applying the blood, you know when faced with the enemy or crisis or something like and all that so my, my my question basically is are we are we misinterpreting that scripture as a basis for why we plead the blood or apply the blood or does that verse support our use of applying the blood you know whether it be it in prayer or whether it be it when crisis or i i don't know um just more clarity, ma. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if we are looking at Revelation 12, 11, and if we go to any commentary, you know, any, you know, established commentary, they would explain, uh, they would elaborate on this, and they would explain what the terms mean. And uh, so, yes, it does come across that if we want victory in our lives, you know, over Satan and over our circumstances, there are two things that would have to be working. One, of course, obviously, is the blood of the lamb, which over here, it's just like a, um, not sure if this is mentioned in your textbook. No, uh, but I did see this in one commentary. You know, where, that, where the author used this term, he said, it's like a shorthand for the work of the cross, the blood of the lamb. And it just simply uses a phrase over there, the blood of the lamb. It is shorthand for the finished work of the uh, of christ on the cross and all that he accomplished for the believers uh, by doing that so rather than you know giving that long lengthy statement about what uh christ has accomplished on the cross for us they simply use the shorthand phrase blood of the lamb so it obviously because of the blood of the lamb that we have victory if uh, the blood of the lamb had not been shed we would not even have victory but there's something else which has to be added to the blood of the lamb over here for us to be conquerors and so it says over here but they have conquered you know the evil one uh, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony so they have testified and said yes this is the word that I am, uh, that, that this is the work of the cross that I am standing upon. And yes, I believe that this will, you know, um, uh, will cancel out the works of the evil one. I believe that the work of what Christ did on the cross is greater than these things that I'm facing. And so they testify and they, is my connection intact? I think it is. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they, this. Well, yeah. Yeah, I just had this notification coming onto my screen. Uh, so, so they testify and declare and say, I believe in this uh, work of the cross. I believe in what the shed blood of Jesus has accomplished. And I stand upon it and I cancel the works of the evil one. And when they do it, knowing what they are doing and they declare it, the evil one has no hold uh, over them any longer uh, because you know he has to come in line with the truth and submit and walk away you know slink away he has no choice so the victory is coming to these people uh through the blood of the lamb over here which means uh the finished work of the cross so the victory is coming through the finished work of the cross and by their personal testimony of it they are declaring it over their lives and saying yes this indeed is going to work even for me, not just for the other believers, but his finished work 
all that he did it even applies to me and my children and my family so they are testifying and declaring it and once they take that stand and they cancel the works of the evil one the evil one has no hold over them uh, it has to leave uh, so uh, so here uh, these people uh, when they were going through this terrible tribulation uh, they were not just randomly saying you know i, I apply the blood no they consciously knew what they were doing uh, they were aware of what this blood stood for what it had accomplished um, which is why even when we you know take the lord's uh, table when we celebrate the lord's table uh, we are holding that grape juice in our hand and we don't just, don't just simply think of it as blood we think of it as a symbol of the covenant what he has done through his blood what he has done through his broken body for us so we focus on what uh, we focus on these two elements as symbols of his finished established uh, signed covenant with us and we know that he will never go back on what he has signed you know so he has put a signature over there and we know that now what we are holding in our hands represents something that is finished accomplished it has been given over to us so now we can boldly claim all that that covenant contains so it's never just simply us thinking of um, uh, the blood as a as an object that can be used like a magic object to ward off evil no we do it consciously by backing it up with by 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 believing in it uh, by through the word of our testimony so over here word of testimony would mean a uh, clear a person who's giving a testimony would need to know what they are talking about uh, otherwise their testimony does not um, you know hold much value so uh, these people when they were giving their testimony they were genuinely testifying about what the cross has accomplished they were fully aware of what it has accomplished and they stood on that and they got their uh, victory you know so mm, yeah we would not we cannot say that um, in our indian um, in our indian religions we have this uh, custom where people tie this sacred thread on the wrist of the babies uh, you know uh, on their uh, you know even grown ups um, so we can't reduce the blood to something like that you know they have a thread on their wrist and we have this invisible blood which we go around applying no no this is not uh, these are not talismans that we are using uh, but we are talking about the finished work of the cross so we would do it in full awareness testifying what we have uh, believed in and then there is power uh, because uh, in his name we are cancelling what the evil one has done and then he no longer has any hold over us so yeah I, that i think does that help <laughs> yeah beautifully explained thank you so much for the clarity thank you, thank you so much oh uh, wow we have more questions i i don't know whether we'll be able to get through our uh, portion uh yeah but yeah i after all, we have to address questions uh, because that is where the learning comes in. So yes, uh, uh, Charles, your name is on my screen first. After that, I have uh, Brother Shri Kumar's name. So first, uh, Charles, if you could go ahead with your question. No, okay. Brother Charles, you do not. You have not. Uh, raised a question then in that case uh, fine we can go ahead with uh, Shri Kumar yes pastor thank you uh, pastor yes. my uh, uh, my question is uh, connected with the blood of Jesus really. now mm -hmm. uh, I just want to know that when Jesus uh, established the communion and he said that he raised the cup and he said that this is this is the uh, this is my blood and I am establishing my covenant with the blood and even if you read the book of Corinthians the Paul again says that this is the cup of blessing. So, mm -hmm. the both the side actually the covenant is established with the blood, and the and Paul also saying it is the the it is the cup of blessing. So, uh, why it is not uh, with the the covenant is not with the flesh? That is my question. Or why why that is uh, not mentioned? Or even even when Jesus said this thing, he's not he never said that it's connected with the flesh, but it is connected with the blood. I just want to know that. Thank you, Pastor yeah it's just that maybe it has to do with creation uh, when uh, human beings and animals were created in the beginning uh, the flesh would be the vessel the carrier inside which 
uh, you would have the life blood flowing because you know it said uh, it's it is said in the old testament and in fact also mentioned in our new testament in acts that the life is in the blood uh, so uh, the life is carried in the blood and uh, uh, the human the human flesh and the animal flesh they are just the vessel inside which this life blood is flowing so life is always in the blood so uh, jesus christ sheds his blood um, you know uh, as in he's laying down his life uh, so that we who are dead can uh, be restored so it's it, it's his life in exchange for our lives so he does that work of appeasement um, you know on our behalf so he is giving his giving up his life in exchange for our dead lives to be restored so uh, he emphasizes and says that the covenant is being established by the blood simply because uh, the life is in the blood and you have i think in three four places in the old testament where you have that wording which says you know do not eat the blood because the, the life is in the blood and of course in your acts where it uh, mentions the life is in the blood so you must not eat the blood so the life is in the blood and that's the reason why um, the blood is used as your symbol in sealing the covenant one life has been given up sacrificed on behalf of the lives of all the other people you know who will now be raised to life to eternal life because of this one life which is being laid down yeah that's it yeah the life is in the blood thank you Pastor. yes uh, so yeah um let us you know uh, look at um, first john chapter 1 verses 8 to 10 um, now there's some very nice things which are you know contained over here in this passage if we could read out verses 8 to 10 please Can I read 8 to 10 if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Yes. The problem with the Gnostics is that uh, they were saying that, you know, they've had this uh, mystical experience with God and now they have been, um, um, their minds have been filled with some kind of special knowledge. And because of that, uh, now they can no longer sin. So they are going around claiming from the time that we had this experience with God, we have not sinned at all. And uh, so John writes over here saying, you know, if you are claiming that you have not sinned, then you are calling God a liar, uh, you know, because um, God talks about how, you know, uh, you, 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 you can repent and he will forgive and he will restore. So when God is saying those things, he is indicating that a person will sin even after they have made a commitment and they can go to him and he will forgive and he will accept. So um, these people who are going around saying that, oh, we are now sinless, we are incapable of committing any sin because we are now filled with the superior knowledge in our minds. He says, you are wrong. What you are saying is wrong. So he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Instead, he says in verse 9, why not just simply, you know, frankly go to the Lord, confess our sins, and he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us. So rather than pretending that we are sinless, rather than pretending that we are not sinning, why not frankly go to him and admit our sin, sin and you know say lord i really don't do not want to do this anymore so please forgive me and if we go with a genuinely repentant attitude he will forgive um another verse that we could uh, another passage that we can you know kind of look at uh, to to you know gain further clarity uh, going back to the gospel of john if someone could read out john chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 John 3, 20 and 21. John 3, 20. For everyone who does wicked things hate the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true. 
but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in god amen okay this this um difference between believers and uh, you know uh, those who are still in the world they don't like coming into the light because their deeds will be exposed they'd rather stay in the dark where their deeds don't look so bad because it's only when you you know uh, bring your actions under the glare of god's holiness then very very clearly it is seen that what you have done is so rotten and it stinks you know or when you're hiding in the darkness everything seems all right everything is gray over there in the darkness right so what you've done also doesn't look too bad the details of what you, of, of your rottenness are hidden and it feels nice you can feel good about yourself so the people who are you know consciously living in the darkness they hate the light because the light really exposes them for who, what they are and then it says in verse 21 those who are in the light on the other hand they come out into the light very plainly it says whoever lives by the light comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of god so what happens when a believer sins you know they feel that they need to go and hide um because obviously they are aware that god is holy and what they have done um, is wrong and so now they feel um guilty and they don't feel comfortable coming into the light coming into his presence but the instruction that we are given over here is do not hide from god do not pretend and try to deceive yourself and say oh it's okay what i did was not too bad let me try you no know, just forget about it no just plainly boldly come into the light come into his presence you know uh, let it be clearly seen that yes what i have done is wrong and frankly admit and say yes lord in the light of your holiness i can now clearly see that what i said on that day uh, was not just uh, an opinion which i expressed but rather i did something very hurtful i actually genuinely hurt that believer and uh, i i realize now that um, it's not me expressing my opinion rather i have sinned against you with my words by tearing down that person i admit that i have sinned so in the full glare of his glory you can see and he can see that what you have done is really bad and you're frankly getting down on your knees and admitting and saying yes what i have done is wrong and now when you come with that attitude the lord he is just and he is faithful and he will forgive and he will purify uh, us from our unrighteousness so we who are in the light uh, never need to hide if we continue to hide either we will go in the uh, in the you know along the line in the direction of deception and start telling ourselves no 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 it's what i've done is not too bad it's okay it's all right uh, we start you know arguing um, and we move into deception or we can be consumed with guilt and think oh my this is one sin that god can never forgive i am beyond forgiveness and uh, we are always held imprisoned by that guilt so whether it is deception or whether it is guilt um as long as we continue to hide uh, satan can take advantage of us and um, we may actually go back into a life of sin so when we are walking in the light it's all right better to come directly into the glare full glare of the light and say yes i can see that what i have done is bad i can see that what i have done is sinful i confess and admit that what i have done is not just a mistake but a sin committed against you and when we come with that attitude and admit it he is immediately just and faithful he forgives and not just forgives he purifies us from the unrighteousness of what has been done so now we are spotless before him again and we can continue with our walk with him so what john is saying over here is do not hide hiding will only create you know greater danger uh, satan can take advantage of us when we sin it's best to immediately come back into his presence even though it is so shameful and humbling because you know in the light of his presence we can see what that what we have done is so rotten but it's okay it's good to be honest and admit what we have done because then the lord can purify us from that unrighteous attitude and he can start working in us to change us and transform us um so we don't have to be stuck where we are we can move on to greater heights in him through him so we, we are, so the advice is to not hide immediately come back into his presence and enjoy what he has to 
offer um maybe we can uh, um yes we have uh, raised hands um charles if you would like to go with your question first i don't know it's just that your name keeps appearing over there i'm so sorry you know it clearly says over there charles and shay have raised hands it says but yeah if charles doesn't have a question um brother shay you can go ahead yes th thank you pastor i'm, I'm sorry i'm yes. just asking too many questions um go ahead yes yes i'm oh, sorry uh, my, my question since we're on the uh, um on the issue of um sin and a believer covering up their sins and all that i, I would just like to get more clarity on um, verse 8 of chapter 1. um mm. the, the reason why i'm asking this is um i i truly get the understanding that if we if we have sin in our hearts we should actually own up to it and confess but there's an attitude that i have seen growing up over the years and is that they use this scripture verse 8 especially um that if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us that's verse 8 of chapter 1 mm. and, and 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 this is the basis is that everybody's a sinner that even as a christian you're still a sinner you still have sin so every time we come to prayer people quote this verse and say ask god for forgiveness for your sins particularly even congressional prayer and and there was a time i really really took took time to really understand that is this really uh, is this really truth like is this what john was trying to point out so maybe maybe for clarity and I'm, i may be wrong maybe maybe what john is saying is exactly what everybody has been saying but the way I look at this verse is, I don't think he's saying that Christians who have been blood washed by Christ, who are not willfully sinning, you know, necessarily always have a sin. Um, I don't know if that's what the verse is saying, but maybe you can give more context. Like, what is John particularly saying? Is he saying that regardless of the fact that we've asked for God for forgiveness, we still have sin. So even when we come to pray, we pray to God, we should also say, God, forgive me for the sins I have. Because that verse, many people have used this verse to say, oh, if we claim we have, we are without sin, we are deceiving ourselves. So better ask God for forgiveness of sin. And even though you know within you that there's nothing, you know, you might have done, and I'm not saying this that, oh, out of pride, that, oh, you're coming with your self-righteousness. But basically, within you, the Holy Spirit has not convicted you. But because of what that person is saying, there's this sense of guilt that comes upon you that, oh, maybe I should just ask God for forgiveness. So I was just maybe if you could just give more clarity on what John was exactly saying in that verse, contextually in his letter. Yeah, that's, that, that's me. That's what I'm just trying to say. Yeah. Uh, so here he's asking them to confess uh, the sin which they have committed. So uh, he's obviously speaking about sins which they have felt convicted about. Uh, so something has been done and uh, they have felt convicted about it. And so rather than, you know, hiding and pretending that what they have done is, uh, is you know, pretending that it's not a sin, it's better to confess and admit that, yes, this is a sin. So there has been, um, they have felt convicted about it. Uh, so um, he is asking for us to go ahead and seek forgiveness whenever we do anything. And it's brought to our awareness by the Holy Spirit saying, what you have done, this is wrong. You must repent. And so we must be willing to go ahead and repent. So I'm sure that over here, um, John is speaking about sins, uh, which we feel convicted about. Um, regarding things that we are doing, you know, sins of, they say, you know, right, not, uh, both, not just uh, sins of commission, which we are more aware of, but also sins of omission, things which you should have done, but you have not done. Um, now, those there are probably scores of those which we are not yet even aware of because Paul, uh, with his level of spiritual maturity, he says he has still not yet arrived. Uh, you know, he has not yet fully been made into the image of Christ. There are still areas in which he is still lacking, in which he is still falling short. Uh, so the more a person grows in, the, in spiritual maturity, 
the more they are coming into the light and the more they are seeing all of their life in the light of that bright light of god's holiness and they what earlier probably did not look like sin is now beginning to look very much like sin and so um the awareness increases as we grow in god uh, the more we our eyes are opened the more closer we draw to him the more we begin to recognize things in ourselves which we thought were all right earlier but now we know that they are not all right so yes we are all in the process of growth and yes we all uh, have these you know attitudes and perspectives and actions that need correction it's just that we are not even aware that we are doing something bad uh, you know so um, yes it is true we will always be imperfect on this side of heaven uh, but it's not necessary for us to live under some kind of you know cloud of guilt and always have to start off our prayers by saying oh i have done i'm a sinful person and my lips are sinful and so even as i begin my prayer please forgive me that kind of um, makes it sound like as if we are living in a relationship of fear um and uh, not really the kind of uh, you know um, the spirit which god has put in us because the spirit which has been given to us uh, teaches us to cry out abba father and uh, to know that we have been declared righteous and now we are safe in our abba uh, and so only when abba corrects and says you know uh, this thing which you have done i think you need to you know uh, admit that what you have done is sinful uh, you know so you, at that time when abba says that better to confess and say yes lord what i have done is wrong so sorry abba i do not do not want to continue this way you pur purify me forgive me and purify me abba will do it um so but to always come to him with that attitude of saying i am a sinner my lips are unclean uh, my attitudes are unclean so please forgive me and then start the prayer that seems like a relationship of fear um and uh, no i don't think god would really like that um he would prefer us to enjoy his presence and feel secure in him and when he gives a word of correction as children we accept it and we say yes lord i'm sorry i i know this is sin and i admit it is sin and i confess so i think that would be a healthier attitude which god would enjoy he wants to be uh, wants us to be secure in him doesn't want us to always you know live in that fear and always feel uh, be feel condemned and guilty no yeah Hi. thank Hi. you pastor i yes. wish yeah. many people could just hear what you said because a lot of christians have the attitude of guilt and condemnation even in the place of prayer and i i, I really really wish because many people isolate this verse and don't look at the context of what john was saying and that's why i just ask so that to gain more clarity thank you so much yes. pastor thank you thank you yes um so um let us now come to maybe verse uh, chapter 2 and um verse 1 and 2 yeah if someone can read out in, uh, in chapter 2 if someone could read out verses 1 and 2 My little children, these things. Right. Oh, yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. My little children, these things are right to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation of our sins. And not for us alone only, but also for the whole world. Yes. So here, uh, Jesus is being described as the propitiation for our sins. Uh, in some versions, uh, the simpler term atoning sacrifice is used. Uh, so in, in your Greek, that would be the word hilasmos. So what exactly is this word hilasmos signifying? Because only over here in this particular verse, and in another one place it's mentioned in the entire new testament so just on the basis of these two verses it kind of becomes difficult to understand what exactly is hilasmos 
uh, what exactly is this propitiation? So what people generally do is they go to the Septuagint, uh, which is your, um, uh, you know, Greek translation of the Old Testament. And over there in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this word Helasmos is used uh, six times. And from there, we can get a kind of broader idea of what exactly this word stands for. And we make the beautiful discovery that over here, this word is not just indicating, you know, cleansing from sin and forgiveness of sin. It is also referring to the removal of God's anger. God's anger against us is taken away, wiped out, removed. God is no longer angry with us. He is completely at peace with us. Uh, so, you know, we have that security to just go to him and say, Abba, Father, uh, because of this, um, because Jesus Christ became this atoning sacrifice for us. So um, Jesus Christ is not only offering us um, cleansing and forgiveness, he is also taking away God's anger against us. So when I have committed a sin, and the minute I realize that what I have done is sinful and I feel convicted, I come into his presence and I say, Lord, you know, I admit that what I have done is sinful. It's not just a mistake, but it's a sin that I have committed against you. So I confess and I repent and I do not want to repeat it any longer. You purify me, O Lord. You forgive me, O Lord. So when I do that, he forgives. And not only does he forgive, he also uh, you know, um, has taken away God's anger against us. So God is not angry at all. He forgives, he cleanses, but anger is not there. That factor of anger is not there at all because right there at that moment when you submitted your life to Jesus and that atoning sacrifice was applied to you and you became a new creation, in that moment, anger was removed from the scene. So God's anger does not apply to a believer anymore unless, you know, like it says in Hebrew, chapter 6 and I think chapter 10, where it talks about a person who has, you know, uh, um, has enjoyed the blood um, uh, and who has uh, tasted of the Holy Spirit. And then in spite of that, they have chosen to go back into the world. For them, there is no repentance. There's only judgment awaiting them. So except for such people, the basic believer is, is not under anger at all, God's anger at all. We are not under God's anger at all. We are under his love. Um, so it's a beautiful thing. We can come to him, you know, when we, when we sin, we can come to him having that full, secure knowledge that he will forgive. He's not angry. He just wants us to stop being foolish and frankly admit that what we have done is sinful and move on because, you know, he will forgive. He will start purifying us. We will be able to overcome this thing in the future. And, you know, life can go on. The relationship can continue to be built between him and us. So we never have to feel insecure. So these are beautiful, amazing things that John is imparting to the church so that um, they can uh, hold on to him confidently and not be led away by all these um, false uh, teachers who are talking about some kind of special club of people who alone have access to God and the rest of them are useless and have no access to God. All that's rubbish is what John is saying over here because he says that this is what Jesus did. He became an atoning sacrifice for us. So even if when you have committed the sin, frankly admit it, come to him and you, your you know, relationship with him will be restored uh, is, what he, uh, is the point that he brings out over here. Um, yeah, uh, maybe the next verse that we can look at um, could be verse 10. I just kind of liked verse 10. Uh, maybe if someone could read out 9 and 10, please. Behold, I send my messenger who clears in the light and hates his brother, it's still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And yeah, there is no cause for stumbling. Yeah, it's a rather, I don't know, uh, big statement. A person who loves their brother uh, and sister and lives in the light, there is nothing in them to make them stumble. I mean, so it's like as if um, a person who's really living in an attitude of love 
you know christ like love the, the, the that love which uh, is willing to correct that love which is willing to pick up a person when they have fallen a love which is willing to oh, you know overlook when they have hurt you in some way and still continue to be kind and compassionate towards them you know a love which does all of those things uh, a person living in that kind of love there's nothing in inside them left that can make them stumble so i think when uh, paul was saying you know i have not yet attained i have not yet reached but you know i'm continuing to press forward towards that that was probably what he was you know aiming for to be that christ like to be to be that full of christ love that everything he does is motivated by love the way he treats people the way he does his ministry why he does the ministry um, you know uh, why he prays how he prays everything he does is colored and um, and soaked by christ love you know so um such a person it says there's nothing left in them which can make them stumble they've they've kind of almost reached christ likeness you know so uh, it's an amazing uh, verse and i was thinking wow i mean if i could be that loving towards people in everything uh, that i do and if i could be that loving in the way i do my ministry in the way i do my bible reading uh, in all my speech uh it's a very high ideal you know to work towards uh but because we have the holy spirit in us uh he is constantly you know causing us to improve and become more and more uh, so that we can actually achieve this ideal you know so um another verse that we can uh, yeah we can maybe move into this new section uh which would be verses 12 to 17 okay so um uh chapter 2 verses 12 to 17 is a new section so in the earlier section we saw people who claim that they know god people who claim that they are christians uh, how would you test them you would test their attitude towards sin and also you would test their attitude towards obedience are they are they obeying him are they keeping his commandments so these are the two tests which you would um, you know apply to people to find out whether they are really genuinely believers their attitude to sin uh, and also their obedience are they living in obedience or not so now we come to this new section which would be chapter 2 verses 12 to 17 where he starts off by saying whom he is talking to and he explains to them why he is specifically talking to them and then he goes on to say something okay so we we have maybe about 7 um, or 8 minutes uh, let's just quickly you know cover that so if you look in verses 12 to um 12 to 14 he makes a repetition over there okay he in verse 12 he says i am writing to you dear children he says and then in verse 13 he says i am writing to you fathers and um, later on in the uh, next portion of the same verse i am writing to you young men okay and almost exactly what he says in verses 12 and 13 he once again repeats the wording in verse 14 it's almost an exact repetition except that he you know changes uh, the phrases a little bit so again he says i write to you dear children and he goes on to say i write to you fathers and then he says i write to you young men so um there are all kinds of interpretations given to this passage and um, uh, you know people talk about how when he says dear children he's talking about people who are still new believers and they have not matured very much uh, and they say that uh, the fathers of course is talking about people who have become very very mature in the lord young men on the other hand they've had some experience in walking with the lord they've had some spiritual victories and so they kind of you know um um uh, popular sermons generally go for this kind of an interpretation but when you look at uh, you know the really established commentaries uh, which have gone into the whole uh, greek and the grammar and all of that uh, they will point out that here is not referring to three categories of people based on their spiritual growth he is actually talking to um he is using the word technon which you know he uses everywhere else in his john uh, in his in his gospel as well as his epistles he refers to everyone as technon irrespective of their spiritual maturity so um, he is speaking in general to all of his dear children all of the people in the church all of the believers 
and in the among the believers he is specifically addressing two categories of people the ones who are fathers the older people age wise nothing to do with spiritual maturity people who are older in age so the fathers and is addressing the youngsters people who are young in age and this is basically what he says he says you know you fathers you who are older who you who have lived longer and you know been with god um, for a longer period of time you know him yeah, not with intellectual knowledge but you know you've been walking with him for a while now because of your age and so you kind of know him more now you know in a in a personal way as for you youngsters you've not walked with him very long uh, but um uh, you have had your victories you know you have stood on the word of god and you have uh, you know been, been able to overcome the evil one and uh, so uh, you to have some experience with the lord so i am addressing all of you dear children i am addressing you fathers who are older in age i am also addressing you young men who are still young and of course you know and we know right um, in uh, those days uh, the masculine word was used you know so over here even though it says fathers it's also talking about uh, the women who are older in age and in the same way when it says young men it's not only addressing the men it's also uh, addressing young girls uh, so um, it, it's just that the masculine word was used even in our older english uh, that's the way the wording was right so they were, when you just say you know uh, men um, it it means doesn't mean just men it means humanity it means both men and women so it's that kind of a wording that is used over here so what is he trying here what is he saying to them he says you older people you know him you younger ones you had victory in him and so because of this he says in verse 15 he says because of you know your walk with him because your sins have been forgiven because you know him because you have overcome satan through the word therefore do not love the world or anything in the world okay that's how he comes to verse 15 so verses um, the uh, 12 13 14 are like an introduction where he's saying i'm talking to these two categories of people because of the experience that they have had with god because of this experience which you have had with the lord do not love the world or anything in the world he goes on to say in verse 15 and he explains what he means by anything in the world um, because he repeats that again in verse 16 where he says everything in the world so anything in the world everything in the world can be divided into three basic elements what are they uh, lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life uh, so he says do not indulge in these three elements because that is what this world is all about so he says stay on your guard because if you are not on your guard and you're given to these three things, you know, it says over there, if anyone loves the world, love for the father is not in them. And uh, why is the love of the father not in such people? He explains in verse 16, he says, um, these things, you know, these three elements of the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, they don't come from the father, they come from the world. So uh, if you are indulging in these three things, you cannot possibly have the love of the father in you because you're indulging in something which is of the world on the other hand if you have been perfected in love then you will automatically see that you are obeying him okay so um, that in fact is some mentioned somewhere in an earlier verse as well uh, where he actually uses that wording mm, that would be in actually chapter 2 verse 5 uh, where he says uh, you know, NIV has a rather unfortunate translation. It says, if anyone obeys his word, love for God is, you know, made complete in them. But it's not actually a conditional statement based on the Greek grammar. The actual translation of that particular verse would be, um, uh, it would be, whoever keeps his word, truly in this one, the love of God is perfected. It's like, you know, you're saying, truly a person who's keeping the word of God, it proves that God's love has been perfected in them. So here he's talking to the fathers and to the young people and he's saying, because 
uh, you know, the love of the father has been perfected in you because you know him, because you have overcome Satan through the word of God. Therefore, do not indulge in these three things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, because these things are coming from the world and not from the father so if you if the love of the father has been perfected in you then you will not be participating in these three things okay so he he gives them that commandment and then you come to the last portion uh, which would be you know verse 18 onwards again you know he kind of warns them and he says you know you have all these false teachers who are coming in so stay on guard against them um you know they acted like as if they were part of us they acted as if they belonged to us but now you know they have gone back into the world so this proves that they were never actually part of our true church you know so he he talks about that and um, um so he says in verse 24 hold on to what you heard from the beginning what was presented to you in originally hold on to that do not stray away from it so uh, these are all things which we have already talked about so we are not getting into the details of it uh, but so the main message he is conveying over here is that because the love of the father has been perfected inside you therefore you don't need to indulge in these three things um, you you are of god you are not of the world so do not be like the people of the world and participate in these three things is what he is uh, saying to them so yeah i think uh, <laughs> there's no time for anything more uh, now next class we'll finish off all the other three remaining chapters three four five we'll cover it next class and then second john third john can be you know done together in the last class uh, so yeah so by this weekend, I'll try to put up the assessment. Uh, the assessment will be only up to whatever we covered today in the class. So there would be 75 questions which you would need to tick. Um, so even if you do maybe five questions a day, you will have time enough you know, to complete. Uh, so yeah, so let's just close with a word of prayer. Oh Lord, we just thank you for the many, many things that we learned uh, in today's session. Lord, Whenever we need these things, bring bring them back to our mind, O oh Lord. Help us to recollect all that we have uh, studied. And Lord, we pray that um, we will uh, be people who are secure in you, uh, people who are confident uh, of your atoning sacrifice, which has been done for us, people who are secure in the work of the cross, and we know what you have achieved for us. And uh, we pray that you would help us to stand on that and claim our victory. I pray, O oh Lord, that uh, because of your work, divine work, which is going on in our hearts, we will not be like the people of the world and indulge in worldly things, which we don't um, need to anymore. We are free in you. So I pray, O oh Lord, that we would remain in your love. And uh, uh, by doing that, we can show to the world that we truly belong to you. Thank you, O oh Lord, for um, all the things that you taught us. And I pray that uh, we would continue to grow in you and become more Christ-like. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, thank you so much for you know patiently staying throughout the class. Um, so we'll meet again next week. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor.